Okay, welcome to Word Without Walls. Welcome to the Tuesday Night Sunlight Service. This is Dwelling Place Part 2. And, uh, and again, I'm really, really excited about this series of messages because, you know, when, when we say things, when, you know, we get a revelation and then as preachers we try to share that revelation and, and you know, it's, you, you get a revelation and you say, okay, all we have to do, guys, we just have to be who we really are. And that's great, and that's fine, and that's perfect. But how in the world are we really practically supposed to do that? And that's what this series is looking at, is, is how we make this real in our lives. How we take this truth and, and sort of uh, let it manifest in our lives, or sort of take, uh, take what's in us and let it out, so to speak. How do we do that? Well, that's what we've been looking at here in, in last week and continuing into this week and for this foreseeable future, is, is really it's just understanding where we are and living out of where we are. And again, the, 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 that's what the, the dwelling place is. It's, it's where we are. It's really, it's who's in us, because uh, our key verse for this series, Psalm 90 verse 1, says, A prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. So, so once again, before we go anywhere else, before we even really start this thing, we understand that the Lord is our dwelling place. Jesus is the promised land. He is our rest. He is our grace. He is our mercy. He is everything that we need. He is everything that we have. He is everything that we are. It's all Jesus. But again, you know, the, the trick is, okay, Jesus lives inside me. How do I get him out of me? How do I live this you know, abundant resurrection life, and the key is that we don't live it at all, we just let Jesus live it in it and through us, but again, you know, I'm trying to make this practical, I'm trying to help us find out what that means on a day-to-day -day basis. So I wrote down the definition for that phrase, dwelling place, again, and it's number 4583 in Strong's Hebrew Concordance, and it means abode, retreat, den, or habitation. And I was really thinking about this definition all week when I was studying out for this message tonight. And it's interesting to me because the first two definitions, abode, or the first definition and the last definition, abode and habitation, kind of mean the same thing where that's like, that's, that's where you live. That's where you are. That's, you know, where the rubber meets the road. Not a visitation, a habitation, we always say. But really what that means is, Something continual, something, you know, something that's always there. Jesus is always living inside of us. He doesn't come and go. He promised to never leave us or forsake us. But then those middle two words, retreat or den, they kind of have a sense of like somewhere that we get away to, somewhere that we go to to, ret to recharge, as it were. You know, if, if you're retreating to something, you're you're getting out of the front lines, as it were, and you're going and you're, you're kind of like recharging and, and getting ready for battle again, so to speak in that sense. So it was interesting to me that that phrase dwelling place, it kind of covers everything you need. It covers where you're at right now and it covers how you get to where you really want to be. And again, we get to where we want to be by understanding that we're already there. We get to our dwelling place, as it were, by knowing that our dwelling place lives inside of us. It's the Lord. It's Jesus. So what we saw last week, and we're going to pick up right where we left off last week in Colossians chapter 3, we read the first uh, 9 or 10 or 11 verses, I think, last week, and we're going to pick up right from there. But what we saw was, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. And I think that's one of the biggest keys to this whole, how do I make this thing practical, how do I do this on a daily basis, is what you set your affection on, what you look at, what you uh, focus on, or what you think about, or what you dwell on, which again is why we call this series the dwelling place. It's all about your your you know your mind. It's about because what you focus on is what becomes real to you. What you uh, magnify in your life is what will manifest. If you're always looking at the problem, the problem is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's what it means to, to, you know, to look at the things on the earth, to look at your circumstances and all these different things. But if you're risen with Christ, you're above all that stuff. If you're risen with Christ, and I say the word if, but, but really what I'm saying is since you are risen with Christ, 
He died on the cross, both for us and as us. We died with Him. We rose with Him. Since we are risen with Christ, all of that stuff is beneath us, and we literally would have to put effort into looking down at it. See, we always think our problems are so big that they're staring us in the face, but they're not. They're beneath us. So in order to really, in order to look at them, what we're doing is we're giving them power. We're, we're taking a God who is all-powerful, a love that is all-powerful, and, and we're giving that power away. We're, we're, we're squandering that power. We're giving something else place in our lives. We're, we're, we're choosing to focus on something other than Jesus, which is echoed in, in the book of Hebrews. I didn't uh, really study that out for this message today, but, but God just quickened it to me again. Hebrews talks about how, you know, Jesus has put all things under our feet. That's a truth. That's a, that, that happened on the cross. And then it goes on to say, but we don't see all things under our feet. Because usually we're not looking under our feet. Usually we're looking at a, at a molehill and making it into a mountain, as it were. But then Hebrews says, but we see Jesus. And that's the key. If we keep our eyes on Jesus, then everything that He is, everything that He has done, the finished work becomes finished in our lives, so to speak, and we begin to really be who we are by, by really just finding out who we are. Finding our lives when, when we understand that our life is hid with Christ in God. So when we look to Him, we find our lives. So let's look at Colossians chapter 3, starting with verse 9. And it says in the King James, Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. And again, this is something we have to understand. I don't need to put off the old man. Jesus did that for me and as me on the cross. I have put off the old man. That's something that's already happened. That's not something that needs to happen. I don't need to struggle with that. What I need to do is I need to stop feeding into that lie, which, it, which again is sin or the devil or whatever you want to call it, that lie that says you have to do things in order to be something. When really what we understand and what we're going to see today, the new man, he doesn't do things in order to be something. He does things because he already knows that he is something. So again, this is not a works-based, performance-based, you know, works and labor religion. That's not what this is about. What it's saying is, is don't lie to each other. Don't believe the lie. Don't look at each other through those eyes, those natural eyes. Don't know each other after the flesh, seeing that you have put off the old man. If you can't see it, you can't be it. If you don't understand that Jesus put off the old man for you and as you are on the cross, you're continually going to try to put him off. You're going to continue to struggle with what it says here, his deeds. And you're going to continue to be an enemy to God in your mind because of your wicked deeds. Because you're still looking at a God who gets angry about what you do instead of seeing what Jesus came to show us, which is a loving Heavenly Father who empowers his Son through affirmation and through love. So see, if, if we're, if, again, if we're buying into the lie and if we're sharing that with each other, then we're struggling with this old man and with his, with his deeds. And, and really what we're supposed to do is, is, you know, we don't need to die because we already did that. We don't need to put off the old man because we already did that. What we need to do is see it. What we need to do is, as, as Paul says in another place, we need to reckon ourselves dead to sin. Don't die to sin because that already happened. But reckon yourself dead, under, dead unto sin and alive unto God. Understand what the finished work was and what it means. And again, I'm convinced that when we truly start to understand what the finished work is and what it means to us today, that's when it's going to become real and powerful in our lives. So the next verse, verse 10 says, And have put on the new man. So again, you don't need to put on the new man. Stop trying to put on the new man. Realize that you have put him on. And when I say you have put him on, again, what I mean is Jesus put him on when he put himself in you. Jesus put him on when he rose again from the dead with you in him. And since you were in him and since he's in you, that's, that's what the new man is. That's what the new covenant is. It's not something we have to do, but it's somebody that we are because of what Jesus did. And now look what it says. It says, and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. How are we renewed in this new man? How are we transformed by the renewing of our mind? In knowledge after the image of him that created him. And who, who created him? God, the Father. So how are we renewed in this? Through the knowledge of God. We are renewed in this thing. We are built up in this thing, strengthened in this thing, as we're going to see, 
by the knowledge of Jesus. When we look in the, in the mirror with, a, with an unveiled face, when we get the law out of the way, when we get sin out of the way, when we get all these circumstances and all these things that hold us back out of the way, and we look into the, the true mirror of grace, when we look into the perfect law of liberty, then we see Jesus in the mirror because he's in us, and then we're changed into that same image from glory to glory. Because again, we already are that glory. We already have been transformed. But see, what we need to do is we need to be transformed. We need to be who we are. And again, you can't be it until you see it. If you're still seeing yourself as a sinner, you're going to keep sinning. Because that's who you believe you are. That's who you confess you are. That's what you're focused on. But if you see yourself as the new man, if you stop trying to put the old man off and put the new man on, if you understand that all of that is finished, if you understand that he put the old man off when he died, when he was buried, and he put the new man on when he was resurrected, when he rose again, when he was seated at the right hand of the Father, when we understand that it's not about what we do, but it's about what Jesus did, then it stops being about works and labor, and then it starts being about enjoying an abundant life. Which again is, is, is the point of this whole Dwelling Place series, is, is to help us to be where we are, to be who we are. And, and again, I think the biggest key to that is, when you see it, you'll be it. So again, we have, to, we have to see the new man in order to be the new man with the understanding that, that the only reason we're seeing it is because it's in us. And then it says in verse 11 of Colossians 3, Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. And again, that's the key. Christ is all. It's all about Jesus. He's in us all, and He is us all. And not only us all, but everything. It says Christ is all. So if you're looking at anything other than Jesus, you're looking at that lie. So again, you can, you, you know, you can choose to believe whatever you want to believe. But there's the way of the world, which, which has already passed away on the cross, and there's a more excellent way, and His name is Jesus. So if given the choice, I would, you know, I would pick Jesus. It's better. He's better. And here we go in verse 12. This is where I really wanted to get to today. This, we stopped uh, last week at verse 11, I believe. It says, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Which we're going to really kind of dig into those two verses, but I want to start at the back and and talk about forgiveness where in, uh, in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, when Jesus was teaching the Jews under the law, he said, forgive one another so that God will forgive you. Because that's the way it worked in the Old Testament. That's the way it worked in the Old Covenant. You had to perform in order to get whatever it is that God had for you or wanted for you. But in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, it says, forgive one another even as Christ forgave you. So again, now it all starts with Jesus. Now, because He has forgiven us, now we are empowered to forgive one another. So He's totally and completely flipped the script. He's totally and completely brought us out of religion and into relationship where everything flows from the Father. Where now it's forgiveness comes from God, so now we can forgive, rather than you better forgive so God will forgive you. So it's a total and complete shift. It's a total and complete transformation from the old man to the new man. And then it says, uh, in verse, in the beginning of verse 12, where it says, put on therefore, which I thought was really interesting, because, you know, we just got finished saying, we have put on the new man, and, and now Paul's saying, so, so now that you put on the new man, put this stuff on? I thought that was interesting, and, and I looked up that phrase, put on, and it's number 1746 in Strong's Greek Concordance, and it means, in the sense of sinking into a garment. So, so here's the picture. Jesus put the white robe on us, so to speak, and now we're putting it on by sinking into it, by wrapping it onto ourselves, by, by, you know, by stretching it out, by, by wearing it, by enjoying or receiving the gift that he has given us. He put it on, and now we put it on by, you know, again, by, by sinking into it. By Jesus saying, here, I've done all the work for you, and I'm saying, okay, thank you, now I can have it, now I can enjoy it. And stay here in Colossians 3, but, but 
the, the put on phrase took me to Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, and the end of that verse says, that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. So again, we see first we're apprehended, and then we apprehend that which we've been apprehended of. First, God grips us with grace, and then because of that, we are able to grip that grace. First, God hugs us. He had his arms open wide on the cross. And then because he's holding on to us and won't let go, then we can begin to grab onto him. Because he showed himself faithful, we can put our faith in him. It all starts with him, and then we respond to that. So again, God made the way of grace, not for us to get to him, but for him to get to us, so to speak. And then we respond to it with the walk of faith. We respond to it by believing that he did what he did, believing that he is who he said he is, believing what that work, finished work means for us. So that's kind of how you put on what Jesus put on you. Or, uh, or as it says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19, it says, And to know the love of Christ, which is what we're talking about, which is the point of all of this, is love. We're talking about love. The Lord is our dwelling place, and He is love. We dwell in and on love in order to make any of this real, in order to make any of this make sense. Ephesians 3.19 says, And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, and that ye might be filled with the fullness of God. So again, you know, we understand that we have the fullness of God. We have His Spirit, and it fills us totally and completely. It fills us to overflowing. But the key is to be filled with the fullness. The key is that what He has put on, we put on by believing, by receiving, by knowing the knowledge of God, the knowledge of Christ, knowing what He did so that we can believe what He did. And, and when we believe it, we, we receive it. And when we, when we receive it, we release it. And when we release it, it becomes real, not just in our lives, but in the lives of everybody around us. So again, the whole point of all of this, it's not put on something you don't have. He's not saying, uh, when he says put on the bowels of mercy, he's not saying you better do this. He's not saying you need this. He's saying this is what we have, so this is what we can do. You, God was merciful to you, so now you have those bowels of mercy. God was kind to you, so now you have kindness. God has humbleness of mind, the mind of Christ, the new mind, his heart, and he's given it to you, so now you can have humbleness of mind. Now, God is meek, so now you can have meekness. So again, all, all, all we're doing is, is we're filling ourselves with the fullness of Christ. Which again, the point of filling ourselves with the fullness of Christ is to know the love of Christ. And that's, again, that's the whole point of all of this. Because all of these th different things, this, 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 this bowels of mercy, this kindness, this humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one, all of those things are just different aspects or different dimensions of love. Because if you love, you forgive. If you love, you're kind. If you love, you have humbleness of mind. If you love, you're meek. It all stems and flows from love. And that's what we've been filled with. So when we fill ourselves with, with the fullness of Christ Jesus, if we fill ourselves with the fullness of God, if we apprehend that which we have been apprehended of, then we, you know, in a, in a sense, we put on what He has put on us. Or, or again, as the word means, we, we sink into the garment that He has put on us. Whether you want it to be, you know, the white robe of righteousness or the crown of glory, whatever the garment is that that we're referring to here, it's basically like he gave it to you, now now take it, receive it, have it, use it. So he says, uh, back to Colossians 3, in verse 14, it says, And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. So he lists off this laundry list of good stuff, and then he says, and above all these, love. Because that's what all these things are. I'm convinced that, that the fruit of the Spirit, you know, we think there's a bunch of different kinds of fruit of the Spirit. I'm convinced that there's one fruit of the Spirit, and it's love. But it manifests itself in different ways. It manifests itself in, in all these, you know, all the different other, what we consider to be the fruits of the Spirit. Whether it's long-suffering or, or what have you. I don't believe that's a whole separate fruit. I believe that's just a part of love. A way to love. Because it all comes back to love. It all starts with love, and it all ends with love. I think more than anything, that's what Jesus meant when he said, I am Alpha and Omega. I think he meant it starts with love and it ends with love. And everything in between is love. It's all him. He is all and he is in all. So, 
When we do that, when we put on that which He has put on us, when we apprehend what we've been apprehended of, when we fill ourselves with the fullness, then verse 15 says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. When you understand what you have and you start receiving it and you start releasing it, instead of trying to get it, that's where peace comes from. That's what peace is. Peace is not, I know if I work really hard, my daddy's going to reward me. Peace is, I have everything I need, and any work that I do flows out of love. It flows out of the fact that I love my dad, and I know he's got my best interests in heart. Because I was thinking about this too the other day. I want to do every single thing that God has for me to do. Not because I think if I do it, he'll be really happy and then he'll bless me, but because I know that what he has for me to do is so good that if I don't do it, I'm going to miss out on something amazing. And I don't want to miss out on something amazing. I don't want to have life when I can have abundant life. I don't want to go my own way, which, which, which may seem right to me, but the end thereof is death. I want the more excellent way, which is Jesus. Nobody knows how to live this life better than Jesus, because he is life. So if I'm trying to do it, I'm going to mess up and I'm going to miss out on some stuff. But if I let him do it in and through me, then I'm going to get every single thing that daddy wants me to have. I'm going to be every single thing that daddy wants me to be. And again, what, what that all comes down to is being loved and loving out of that love. Because again, that's the whole point of everything. The reason that we are here is so that God can love us and we can love each other with that same love. That's the whole point of all of it. And when we understand that, when we put on that love, when we fill ourselves with what we've been filled with, then the peace of God rules in our hearts. Because then we're not trying to get everything, anything, because then we already know that we have everything. And it says, uh, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. I don't think Daddy wants you running to Him and, and begging for stuff. I think he would much rather us know what we've got and be thankful for it. And that's why anymore, all I can think of to do when I pray is just thank the Lord. He knows my needs. He knows my wants. He knows everything. And, and really, it's his good pleasure to give it to me. The Bible said, Jesus said, fear not, little flock. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And again, that's what happened on the cross. He gave us the kingdom when he gave us the king. So, again... When we understand that and that peace of God rules in our hearts and we're not trying to get something, then we can stop looking at all the stuff we think we don't have. We can focus on what we do have, which is love, and we can be thankful for it and, and we can have that peace. So it says in verse 16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. And again, what's the word of Christ? Love. Jesus is the word of God. You know, John chapter 1 teaches us that in the beginning, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and, and that's Jesus, and then the Word was made flesh. So, so what's the Word of Christ? Love. What's he saying here? Let love dwell in you richly in all wisdom. And again, I'm convinced that love is all wisdom. I'm convinced that the ultimate truth of the universe is that the Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hands. So if you think you need to know something, what you need to know is the love of the Father. If you think you need wisdom to make a decision, Act out of love, and you can't go wrong. Follow your heart when you understand that it's not your heart, it's His heart that beats in your chest with love. So it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And this is important too, because first he says, Teaching and admonishing one another. And then he says, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So again, what we see is how do we love God? By loving one another. How do we sing to God? By singing to one another. How do we enjoy God? By enjoying one another. Because he, again, he's in all of us. So, you know, when, when, when I love you, uh, of course I'm loving God because God is in you. So what we see here is, you know, we, we always think, you know, God's way up in heaven somewhere and we're way down here on earth somewhere and we have to lift up our praises to him. But really, we lift up him by lifting up each other. We lift up praises to Him by praising one another. We love Him by loving one another. It's all about taking what's in us and giving it and sharing it with each other. Because that's where God is. That's who God is. He's one person in a many-membered body. I'm part of Him. You're part of Him. And then in verse 17 it says, And whatsoever ye do, in word or deed, 
do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. And again, that doesn't mean go around saying the name of, that doesn't mean go around saying Jesus. Like, like do something and then say, all right, I did that for Jesus. I did that because of Jesus. What that means is whatever you do, do it in the name or the character, which is love, of the Lord Jesus. Everything that you do, do it in love. And then you can't go wrong. Because love never fails. So what we see again is that it all comes back to love. Whatsoever you do, in word or deed, whatever you say, whatever you do, just let it be love. And, and, and again, the only way we can do that is when, when we know that we are loved. Because you can't give what you don't have. And if you don't know and believe that you're loved, you won't be able to love anybody else. Because in, in, in exactly the same way that you can't give what you don't have, you can only give what you do have. So if you're hurt, all you're going to be able to do is hurt other people. Hurting people hurt people. Not on purpose, but because that's what they have to give. And in the same way, when you are loved, then that's what you have, and then that's what you give. And in fact, you know, again, when, when, when we're filling ourselves with the fullness, what it means to be full is to be overflowing. So then it stops even being, I have to love because God loves me. Then it starts being, I'm so full of love that it just comes out naturally. Because I am that new man, because that's my new nature. Again, not because of what I do, not because of what I'm doing, not because I need to try to do something, but all because of what Jesus did for me and as me 2,000 years ago on the cross. So, let's look at this in the Message Bible. And then I have one passage in Ephesians and one more verse that I think will again lead us into next week. So Colossians 3 starting with verse 9 in the Message Bible reads, Don't lie to one another. And again, here's the key here. We lie to one another when we believe the lie. Because you give what you have. If what you have is the lie, then that's what you, that's what you do. It says, Don't lie to one another. You're done with that old life. It's like a filthy set of ill-fitting clothes you've stripped off and put in the fire. And again, you know, some, sometimes I really, really like the Message Bible because Jesus took those, those filthy clothes off of us and put them in the fire, which is God. And, and again, He gave us His, as it says, uh, next up it says, Now you're dressed in a new wardrobe, which goes right back to the meaning of that phrase, put on, in the sense of sinking into a garment. So he took your old life, he took that old ragged set of clothes, he took everything that you did when you were trying to gain something you thought you didn't have, all of that stuff that the Bible says that, that you're probably ashamed of now, that there's no pride in it, there's nothing good in it, you ate from the tree of death, and, and that's what the tree of death produced. Jesus took all of that off of you and threw it into the fire and purified you and brought you out the other side with a new wardrobe. He did all of that. And then we put on that which he put on us by just sinking into it, by just saying, oh, look, new clothes. And, and you know, there's really nothing better than, than clothes straight out of the dryer when they're nice and warm. That's what that phrase made me think of. When, you, when you're when you sinking into a garment, when you're, you know, you're wrapping it around you and you're so comfortable in it and you're so happy with it and you're like, man, I was cold, but, but now I'm warm. Now I have that peace inside of me that I don't need anything else. Everything I needed was provided for me on the cross in the person of Jesus. So it says, now you're dressed in a new wardrobe. Every item of your new way of life is custom made by the Creator with His label on it. So again, this, you know, it, 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 there's, a, there's a sense of, of, of maturation and there's a sense of you know, growing into things. But the truth of the matter is, is that you, he, he, what He made for you is custom made for you. You don't have to grow into it. You have to understand that when He made it, you were perfect and it was perfect. And the only growing you do is seeing that perfection in yourself. You're not gaining perfection, you're seeing it. You're seeing that He made me just the way He wanted me to be. I don't have to be somebody else. And in fact, I can't be anybody else. The trick is not to try to be like Jesus. The trick is to let Jesus be himself in me. And then when I let him be himself in me, then, then, then what's in me comes out of me. And then I start to, to not only retreat to my dwelling place, I start to not, not only you know, be a quote-unquote good Christian when I'm around other Christians, then it becomes a habitation for me or, or, or a habit for me where it's just what I do. 
because it's just who I am. So it says, uh, all the old fashions are now obsolete, which, which really, when we start to see how good it is in Daddy's house, we're not going to be tempted by anything else. We're not going to want anything else. When you know how good you've got it, when you've seen both sides of the coin, and you can say, man, it's hard out there in the world, the way of a transgressor is hard, the Bible says. But Jesus said, you know, if you're tired, come to me and I'll give you rest. He says it doesn't have to be hard because I already did it all. I finished the work. You don't have to do it anymore. And again, you know, I'm not saying you never do anything else. I'm just saying when you do things from a posture of rest, which, which all that rest is is Holy Spirit-directed activity, when you're simply flowing in what you have been called to do, when you've truly apprehended that which you were apprehended of, when you understand that God's got something for you, but the best part is He's doing it in you, then it still gets done. It's just not you working really hard to do it. It's just you flowing and having fun and enjoying the ride. So he says, uh, all the old fashions are now obsolete. Words like Jewish and non-Jewish, religious and irreligious, insider and outsider, uncivilized and uncouth, slave and free, mean nothing. From now on, everyone is defined by Christ. Everyone is included in Christ. So again, when I look at somebody, I don't look at people, look into people. See the Christ in them just the same way that it's in you. Stop judging people by the flesh. Stop knowing people after what they do or what they say. And instead, give people a chance to be who they really are. Give people a chance to surprise you. Love somebody and see if they don't return that love now that they have some to give. Now that they have some to return. So he says, from now on, everyone is defined by Christ. Everyone is included in Christ. So, chosen by God for this new life of love, the whole point, a life of love, to live is to love, and to love is to live. He says, dress in the wardrobe God picked out for you, which again is another way of saying, put on that which he put on you. He made it available to you, all you got to do is receive it and use it. So he says, this is, this is the wardrobe that he picked out for you. This is what we're dressing in. This is what we're putting on. Compassion, kindness, humility, quiet strength, discipline. Be even-tempered, content with second place, quick to forgive an offense. Forgive as quickly and completely as the Master forgave you. And regardless of what else you put on, wear love. It's your basic, all-purpose garment. Never be without it. If you don't know what to do, love. If you don't know what to do, do what you know. What do you know? The love of God. You're full of it. You need to fill yourself with that so that it overflows. What's in you comes out of you. If you don't know what else to do, love. Let the peace of Christ keep you in tune with each other. And I like this because I've said this for a long time. The only way that I can truly line up with you is if I line up with Jesus and you line up with Jesus, then we will automatically line up. So it says, let the peace of Christ keep you in tune with each other. Don't worry about differences. Focus on what's together, what's connecting us. And what's connecting us is, is that same love. So it says, in step with each... Uh, keep you. Let the peace of Christ keep you in tune with each other, in step with each other. None of this going off and doing your own thing. And cultivate thankfulness. Let the word of Christ, the message, have the run of the house. And if we understand that he is the king, if we understand that the kingdom is, is the realm where the king rules and reigns, then what else could possibly have the run of the house? What else could rule and reign in our lives other than the word of Christ? And what is the word? Love. So again, what we're talking about is love. We're talking about dwelling in love, which, which I think is really what we're going to look at next week. So it says, give it plenty of room in your lives. Give what plenty of room? The word, love. Give love plenty of room in your lives. Don't make it, you know, something that, that you force or something that you, that you try to fit in when everything else is done. Start with love. And then you will automatically end with love. So he says, instruct and direct one another using good common sense. And sing. Sing your hearts out to God. Let every detail in your lives... Words, actions, whatever, be done in the name of the Master, Jesus, thanking God the Father every step of the way. So, so again, how do we, how do we make sure that, that every detail in our lives are done, is done in the name of 
the Master Jesus? Start with love. If you start with love, you're starting, you're building on the rock. You're, you're, you're building on the foundation that, that, you know, Paul said in another place, there's only one foundation and it's Jesus. And, and there's no other foundation that any man can lay. And if you build on the foundation, then, then Jesus said, if you build on the rock, when the winds come, when the storms come, your house will stand. He said, when you start with love, nothing else can get through it. Because if God is all-powerful and God is love, that means love is all-powerful. So if we start with love, then, then we've won before we've even started. So turn to Ephesians chapter 4. And I'm going to start with verse 11. And I don't know if I'm going to stop saying this or not. I probably won't stop saying this. But I feel like this is kind of a familiar passage. But, but again, it goes right along with what, with what we're teaching tonight. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 says, speaking of uh, the ministry of God, it says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. You know, what, what we refer to as the fivefold ministry. And this is why he gave those. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So, so again, how are we coming into this knowledge? How are we coming into this fullness? How are we apprehending what we've been apprehended of? How are we filling ourselves with the fullness? How are we dwelling in our dwelling place? With each other. Helping each other along the way. Everybody has different talents. Everybody has different gifts. And they were given for the perfecting of the saints. Which again, you know, to, to me, you know, we are perfect. But what the perfecting is, it's the, the revelation of our perfection. The revelation of Jesus' perfection in and through us. I don't need to be any more perfect. God said, be perfect as I am perfect. And if I'm expected to do that on my own, that's mission impossible and I'm going to fail. But if I understand that He is perfect and He's doing it in me, then I've already done it. And all I need to do is figure out what that means in my individual life. And, that, and again, that's, that's what we help each other with. So it says, and, and I really like this too, it says, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. We all come into the unity of a perfect man. We are all members of the same body of Christ. We are all the new man, the new creature, the perfect man. And that's what we're coming into, the unity of faith and the knowledge of Jesus, who is that perfect man. So, so again, you know, there's an individual sense where I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. You know, I, I'm just as much Jesus as I could possibly be. But there's also a, a, a uh, corporate sense where, where we are all joints of supply, where we are all connected to each other, where I may not be good at something that you are good at, and in that way, we can help each other. You're the yin to my yang, so to speak. And when we get together, it's even more powerful. And, 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 and then again, it's, it's that unity of faith. It's, it's, it's all of us growing up into that one perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And then it says, That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So again, he's saying, when we do this, when, when we build each other up with the truth, then the lie is not going to mean anything to us. We're not going to be worried about it. We're not going to be interested in it. We're going to know the truth. We're going to stand on the truth. We're going to live in and out of the truth. And then people can say whatever they want to say, and it's not going to matter. And then circumstances can come and, 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 and be what may, and it's not going to matter. Because I know who I am, and I know who my daddy is. And then my retreat becomes, again, it becomes my habitation. Then where I go to be alone with God is where I go to be together with God. And I think that's a more powerful, you know, and I'm not saying you shouldn't go to be alone with God because, you know, you should. There is a, a, a very important aspect of, of just one-on-one -on -one time with God. But again, I think the, 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 the more real way, the, the more practical way that we do that, because sometimes it's hard to know what to do by yourself. What do I talk to God about? What do I say? How do I pray? All these different things. But when we're, when, when, when we're with each other, we can share, we can grow, we can get different ideas, different viewpoints, different flavors of the fruit of love, if you want to say it that way. 
So then he says that we're not children, we're not tossed to and fro, we're not believing the lie anymore, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So again, you know, we're not going up, we're growing up. We're maturing, we're coming into the knowledge, we're coming into the manifestation, as it were, of, of the head of the body, which is Christ. So when, when He really starts to have His will and His way in your life, that's, that's really when you know I'm starting to mature. Mature is not more control, mature is more surrender. Mature is not, okay, God, I can do this. You want me to do it, I'll do it. Maturity is, okay, God, you want this to happen, you better do it in and through me, because I can't do it. That's what true maturity is, is knowing that it's not me doing it, but Him doing it in me. So it says, but speaking the truth in love may grow up, and, and again, you know, to me the truth is love, so there's no way to speak the truth without speaking it in love, but it says, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into Him in all things, which is the head, even Christ for whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body, ready? This is why we're all together, this is why we're a many-membered body, this is the whole point of it, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. We are together to build each other up in love. We are together to love each other with the same love that we are loved with. That's why we exist. That's why there's more than one human being. That's why God made so many of us, because He wanted us to be able to connect in this way, to be able to edify each other, and build each other up, and touch each other, and help each other, and love each other. That's the whole deal, man, because love is too big to stay in one place or in one person. That's why it wasn't enough for Jesus to come as a man and have love dwell among us, but no, God said, no, I, I need love to dwell in you all. I need it to be in everybody, not just where Jesus is, but where you are. Because again, with the understanding on this side of the cross, where you are is where Jesus is. Where you are is where love is. So again, that's, that's the dwelling place. That's not where we go. I mean, that's not some place that we go. That's wherever we are. So, in the Message Bible it reads like this. He handed out gifts above and below, filled heaven with his gifts, filled earth with his gifts. Which again, when you understand the new heaven the new earth is, is our mind and our body. He filled your mind with gifts, he filled your body with gifts. He gave you so much, he gave you the kingdom, he gave you himself. But not to hoard up, not, not, not to squander, to use, to enjoy, to share. He gave you love so that you could love. It says, he handed out gifts of apostle, prophet, evangelist, and pastor teacher to train Christ's followers in skilled servant work, working within Christ's body, the church, until we're all moving rhythmically and easily with each other, efficient and graceful in response to God's Son, fully mature adults, fully developed within and without, fully alive like Christ. Until you understand that Jesus is abundant life, you're never going to be fully alive in that abundant life. Until you understand that it's not you living, but it's Him living in you, that's when it all starts to become real. I'm not living Jesus' life. I can't. It's impossible. Humanity couldn't even keep the laws that God gave them, much less live an abundant resurrection life. So what the key is, again, is that it's not me living it. I died. I put off, Jesus put off the old man and he put on the new man. But he did it all. It's all him. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh that he might condemn sin in the flesh. He took whatever was in me out of me to make room for the Holy Spirit, to fill me up with it. He took those ill-fitting clothes and got rid of them and gave me his clothes. Which again is what we saw in the garden when Adam and Eve made you know aprons out of fig leaves. They did the best they could with what they had, but God said, that's not what I want for you. I'm going to give you lambskin. I'm going to totally and completely cover you. I'm going to make, and again, that was type and shadow in the, on the cross. God said, I'm not just going to cover you. I'm going to transform you. I'm not just going to put Jesus on the outside. I'm going to put him on the inside because that's where it's real. That's where true love comes from. It comes from the heart. It comes from God's heart beating in our chest. So it goes on to say in Ephesians 4, Chapter or uh, verse 14 in the Message Bible goes on to say, 
No prolonged infancies among us, please. We'll not tolerate babes in the woods, small children who are an easy mark for imposters. God wants us to grow up, to know the whole truth, and tell it in love. So again, what is maturity? Knowing the whole truth. What is the whole truth? That Daddy loves you. How can I be a mature Christian, as it were? By knowing that God loves me and by loving each other out of that same love. That's as much maturity as you need because that's as much maturity as there is. And everything else works from that and flows from that. If I know I'm loved and I'm loving people out of that love, then I've got it. And I may not always get it exactly right because, again, I am still in this process of finding out what the love of God truly is, testing out the height and the depth and the breadth and the width of it, figuring out what exactly it means to be loved so that I can love that same way. But if I know that much, then I know what I need to know. And then the Holy Spirit will take my hand and, and, and lead and guide me into all truth. I know all things, but I don't understand all things. So if I know that I'm loved, then I got it. And now I just need to figure out what it is that I've got. Which again, I think is this whole deal about, you know, putting on what, it, what, what Jesus put on us, apprehending what we've been apprehended of, filling ourselves with the fullness. It's just saying, I got it, now let's figure out what I've got. Now, now let's use it. Now let's, you know, let's sink into it, so to speak. So he says, God wants us to grow up, to know the whole truth, and tell it in love, like Christ in everything. We take our lead from Christ, who is the source of everything we do. He keeps us in step with each other. His very breath and blood flow through us, nourishing us so that we will grow up healthy in God, robust in love. If you've got the breath of Jesus, and you do, and if you've got the blood of Jesus flowing through you, and you do, then how could you be anybody else but Jesus? That's who he is. That's what the new covenant is. That's how we grow up healthy in God. That's how we're robust in love, is by understanding that it's already there. We already have it. We don't need anything. We've already got it all. We've already been blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly Christ. We've already been given all things that pertain to life and godliness. So again, if we've got it all, what we can do is we can stop looking for something and we can start looking at someone. We can stop looking at things below, things on the earth. We can stop looking at quote-unquote bad stuff and we can decide, hey, if all things are working together for my good, I don't need to complain about this. What I need to do is learn from it. What I need to do is inject love into it. What I need to do is say, if this is working together for my good, then it's not a bad thing. It may look like a bad thing, it may feel like a bad thing, but we walk by faith and not by sight. We know Daddy's got our back and whatever we're going through, not only is he going to get us through, but what really has happened is he already got us through it. What really has happened is he has already perfected us when he perfected himself. Remember, uh, I, don't, I don't remember what, exactly which uh, series it was in, but we talked about how Jesus learned obedience through the things that he suffered. Or, or through the things that, you know, he experienced. He did all of that. He learned everything he needed to know so that he could tell it to us. Jesus said in another place, he, he said, the, when the Holy Spirit comes, it's going to take of me and give it to you. That's what it's here for. It's here to be our love receptor, to, to help us know the love of God so we can believe the love of God, so we can be the love of God. So let me end with Psalm 91, verse 1. And I thought this was interesting because we started with Psalm 90, verse 1, which talks about uh, the Lord being our dwelling place in all generations. And we're going to end in the next chapter, Psalm 91, verse 1. And I think this is going to bring us right into next week. Psalm 91, verse 1 says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So again, that's, that's the whole deal. And, and I'm not saying if, because the truth of the matter is, is that's where we dwell, that's where we are. That's not something we need to do. In the Old Covenant, it was something you attained to. In the New Covenant, it's something that you realize. So, so he that dwelleth, which, which is Jesus, which is us, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That's where we're at. And what we're going to see next week is that's the safest place that you can be. That's, and again, I don't want to give all of next week's message, but, but that's what it means to hide in the rock. That's, that's what it means for Jesus to, to, to take his wings and to cover you with them, like, like a mama hen protects her chicks. That's what it means, as we just saw about, 
about the head leading us. But we're going to really look at what it means to dwell uh, in the secret place. We're going to look at what the secret place is. And we're going to talk about abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. We're going to do that next week. So uh, that's all I have for this week. Uh, amen.